Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, John. Thank you for the Sun Valley Writers Conference for having me here. It's been a little journey for me to get here, and I'll get into that later. And thank you all for coming. And sorry, you, we all have to sit in this heat. I've, as John said, had many years in the desert, in the Kalahari, where it'd be 120 degrees, so I think I can get through this. When I was a, a young girl, I thought reading was something you did when it rained. I was a tomboy, an outside girl. I got it from my mother. She used to encourage my girlfriends and I, whether we were exploring on foot or riding our horses, to go as far into the oak forest as we could go. She wanted me to experience true nature. She wanted me to see, a, a, maybe see a doe with her fawn, not just a deer running away from me because we were humans. She would say to me, go way out yonder where the crawdads sing. I don't think my mother realized how seriously I was gonna take her advice until she saw me boarding an airplane to Africa with a one-way ticket. With my coworker and former husband, I spent 23 years in some of the most remote regions of that continent, studying lions, brown hyenas, and elephants, or whatever else came into camp at night. And since then, I've spent most of my life in or near wilderness. During my research, which was so fascinating in so many ways, but one of the things that, that struck me the most was how much our behavior is still like other species. I'd be watching a young male baboon walking along a riverbank. He'd pump out his chest and he'd strut back and forth, back and forth in front of the females. And I'd think to myself, yes, I know that guy. <laughs> in the wild, tightly bonded groups of mammals, like the pride of lions or the herd of elephants, are made up only of females. If the males stayed in their natal groups for all of their lives, they'd only have females, with, related females, with whom to breed. So at adolescence, the males have to leave their birth group and they spend the rest of their lives going from one group or one female to the next for mating. And this is when my, female, this is when my friend said to me, you had to go all the way to Africa to learn that males go from one female to the next for mating. And these female groups, they may be tightly bonded, but they're not all sweetness and light. Lionesses will cooperate beautifully to bring down a buffalo, but as soon as they get to the table, the claws and the teeth come out. In the female group, there is as much conflict as there is camaraderie. And if a female who's slightly different tries to join the group, she will be rejected. I learned this from studying hyenas. I also learned it by being in a sorority. <laughs> we know it's true. Mm. In the last century, we had the interesting debate about whether human behavior is from nature or nurture. Almost universally, science and the general population came to the conclusion that much of our behavior is instinctual. Now we know this to be a fact because we have decoded our genome. We have seen that more than 99% of our genes are the same as our closest relatives. That includes many genes for behavior. But after we came to the conclusion that much of our behavior was instinctual, we sort of dropped the subject 
Many people stopped asking the more interesting question, now that we know a lot of our behavior is instinctual, how does it influence our daily behavior? For years in the Kalahari, we'd go out every evening out to a dune top and sit with a pride of lions waiting for it to cool down enough for them to go hunting. They would move into the shade of our truck because it was the coolest spot for miles around. The females would sleep in easy piles with their paws draped over each other's faces. It was hard to tell where one lioness started and the other one ended. And then we'd see them romping and playing with their cubs and each other's cubs. And I would think about my girlfriends back home. I missed my pride. And when I visited the States once a year, I discovered that many of my friends here who lived in cities of over a million people were also lonely. You do not have to live in a wild marsh to be lonely. After seeing ourselves in wildlife every single day, I became determined to write a novel that would explore and reveal how much of our innate behavior influences our feelings and our actions, our lives, our choices for mates, our languages. We can understand our feelings and actions better if we know where these behaviors and why these behaviors evolved eons ago. I thought it would be better to express these thoughts in a novel because it would reach more people. And I had written scientific papers and co-authored three nonfiction books, so I thought, how hard can it be to write a novel? And 10 years later, <laughs> Um, I finally published my novel, and I have a little story to fill in some of that later, but I'll, I'll do that after I finish. And in my novel, in this novel, Where the Crawdads Sing, Kaya represents that part of us that came directly from nature. She is symbolic of the instincts that surge in us. Chase also represents instincts, while Tate, a character, I don't know how many of you read the book, but another male character, though imperfect, is more, he represents the more recent human who has strived to add morality to our behavior. Sorry. Oh. It is hot. In the first scene of my novel, we see a mother walking away from her child. This, one of the harshest behaviors that we can imagine, is not uncommon in nature. I have watched lionesses leave their cubs in times of drought. As the novel describes, a vixen who is severely wounded will leave her kits. They will die but she may live to breed another day and her new offspring may have a better chance of survival. This is nature's finding an efficient way for life itself to endure, even at the cost of a few individuals. That we think of this as harsh is what makes us human but we carry the genes for abandonment in us, and humans do abandon their children. Where the Crawdads Sing also asks the question, since we have a, a very strong genetic propensity to belong to a group, how much would isolation affect the behavior of a young girl who is abandoned by her family and, and forced to grow up mostly alone. Kaya was tough because she'd been raised in the marsh. Sometimes she heard night sounds she didn't know or jumped from lightning too close. 
but whenever she stumbled, it was the land who caught her. Kaya laid her hand upon the breathing wet earth and the marsh became her mother. Since she had no family, almost no friends, she bonded with seagulls and the moon. Because if anyone would understand loneliness, the moon would. Kaya was rejected by the villagers, lied about and discriminated against because she was different, the same way lions and hyenas reject strangers. And isolation affected Kaya deeply. She would duck walk through reeds to avoid being seen. She would hide from people in the palmettos. Kaya's behavior looked more and more like a wild female primate isolated from her troop. I know because I have seen them drifting back to the predictable cycles of tadpoles and the ballet of fireflies, Kaya burrowed deeper into the wordless wilderness. Nature seemed the only stone that would not slip midstream. And all of this odd behavior made her even stranger in the eyes of the villagers who called her names and sneered at her. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, did we discriminate against Kaya because she was different or was she different because we discriminated against her? Inside of us, there are genes to be social, to join and belong to a group. So rejection and isolation change people, makes them fragile and yet the fear can make them aggressive. With discrimination, both sides lose in the end, as the villagers did. But to nature, abandonment and rejection are not evil. Biology sees right and wrong as the same color in different light. It looks at harsh behavior as inventive ways for life to, to prevail against all odds. But Kaya surprised me. Here I was, I thought I was the author, that I was in charge. As I wrote Kaya, she was shy and afraid, which I expected. But every time I threw an obstacle in her path, she solved it. And every solution gave her confidence and independence. She learned more, grew wiser, became gritty, even witty. It seemed that she could tackle anything but loneliness. And as she reached adolescence, aloneness came too big for her to bear. The time came when she longed to be loved, to be touched. Reproductive instincts switching on. Male choice, male choice is a science of its own. That is, just explains the, the behavior of a individual in the wild, a male choosing a female, or usually a female choosing a male with whom to breed. Volumes have been written about mate choice, about males in the wild behaving in very creative ways to attract females. In nature, females select the males with the most impressive antlers, the deepest croaks, the reddest feathers, the craziest displays we can imagine. This is not frivolous. These males have competed against each other. So the alpha males have the best territories for the female and her offspring. So for eons, females have selected these alpha males with whom to breed, even if they are more aggressive. One morning at the age of 19, Kaya was walking down the beach 
and she looked up to see a, young, a group of young adults walking toward her. She hid behind a tree, as she always had. But now that she was older, her eyes shifted to the tallest guy. She watched the muscles bunching out on his back, his broad shoulders. She knew he was Chase Andrews, the Tom Turkey. Kaya watched them, mostly him, walk on down the beach. But she went back every day, hoping to see him again. It was not her heart selecting this male, but her instincts choosing the alpha. In the wild, some lesser males with small antlers or squeaky voices attempt to mimic the alpha so that females will choose them. A small, tiny bullfrog will hunker in the grass right next to the big male who's croaking strongly. And when the alpha is busy copulating with one of the many females that he has attracted, the little tiny bullfrog will hop in and sneak a copulation. <laughs> Science doesn't usually have a sense of humor, but even in the peer-reviewed journal, these pretender males are referred to as sneaky fuckers. <laughs> it's science, so I can say it. <laughs> of course, this happens in humans too. We've all seen the enormous tires on the tiny trucks. <laughs> We're not often that fooled, I hope. The reason Kaya's mother warned her sisters, lesser boys make the most noise. But Kaya's mother was gone, so Kaya followed her instincts into the trap of a lesser male. Instincts, of course, influence us in many ways. Several times in my novel, I ask the question, why do our words need somewhere to go? Why did Kaya feel compelled to reach out to others with words? I suspect everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about and has felt this way. Why do I want to write? Why do I want someone to listen, to read what I have written? Well, part of it is instinct. For millions of years, almost back to the first organisms, we have communicated. On the African savanna, if a tiny little meerkat sees a predator, it will give its alarm call. Then the impala will whistle an alarm, and this sets off the baboons in a shrieking ruckus. And because of all this, a few kudu See the lions hidden in the grass. With this trans-specific communication, the individuals were forewarned and took anti-predator behavior and survived. So the act of sending and receiving messages enhances survival and thus evolves. The need to be heard, the need for someone to listen, to read your words, is deeply seated. That is the reason we feel it. Communication, of course, also enhances attraction of mates in birds and frogs and elk and lions and almost every species. Go eons forward and you have love letters, poetry, novels, Kai had no one to listen to her, so she secretly wrote and published poetry. And humans did not invent lying. Dishonesty is an ancient trait. Nature has made an art form of deception. As Kaya learned, female fly, um, fireflies can change their beautiful flickering codes to deceive the males of a similar species, draw them in for mating, and then eat them instead.
Kaya learned from her marsh how to optimize her instincts. I write in Crawdads early on, on page eight, that when desperate or threatened, humans revert to those instincts that aim straight at survival, quick and just. Those behavior patterns of self-defense are not born of or bound by our morality. They exist in our genes because they ensure the survival of our ancestors. Kaya had to fend for and protect herself. We may have one of the best legal systems in the world, but many people slip through the cracks. They are not protected by law enforcement and they are not given justice by the courts because of discrimination. Kaya knew this and was forced to act on her own. These were not her peers. Sometimes in these cases, such as Kaya's, the laws of nature are more just than the laws of man. But even if they are not, the behavior will prevail if survival is enhanced. Kaya learned how to survive from nature, and for years she got by, but she struggled. Her loneliness became louder and louder. And then Kaya learned how to read. After her first attempt, she whispered, I wasn't aware that words could hold so much. I didn't know a sentence could be so full. Once she could read, she could study and she became a proficient of the natural world from which she emerged. Having a language plus an understanding of nature offered her an insight few ever have. Words gave Kaya wings, lifted her from mere survival to soaring as they have done for us. Words gave her an occupation and worth. As I have said, all animals communicate, but when a lion bares his teeth and snarls, there is very little room for misinterpretation, mainly because those who misunderstood this very simple message are no longer here. <laughs> their genes did not pass on. The ancient languages of the wild are usually clear and precise. We added complexity, which diminished clarity. The more abstract our language became, the more artful and creative. Combine this with our vivid imaginations and you have literature and songs that touch our souls. I learned from a book that crawdads don't really sing. But I learned from my mother that if you go far enough into the wilderness and stand there alone, you will hear them anyway. My mother was right. Where the crawdads sing is a real place where critters still behave as they have for eons. And if you are lucky enough to glimpse that place, you will see where, why, and how we became who we are. Perhaps what sets us apart the most is this ability to not simply receive and send a message, but to reach each other's soul deeply with mere sounds. We have transformed primitive barks and yaps into novels and poetry, into the expression of science and democratic ideals. We don't just sense gravity like other species, we can explain in words and math while, why we tumble through space time toward objects of greater mass. There's not another species 
who can do that. We have taken expression to the very rim of reason. If we choose to do so, this could give us the heart and the intelligence to be truly human, to rely less on instincts and crawl higher onto more moral and scientific ground. And yet, the primitive barks and yaps within us stir crowds into folly. Like fireflies, we flash lies and blur truth into versions. We have a ways to go. There was a little girl standing alone in a marsh with her hand up against discrimination, against physical abuse, against abandonment and rejection. And yes, maybe she grew into a young woman and later into an elderly lady, but we will always see her as that little child. And because she was a child, it is easier for us to say, if she can stand up against injustice, so can we. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Delia. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. We've got uh, microphones. Please hold your hands high. There's a woman here in the middle yes. in a blue shirt. She's coming with the mic. <laughs> I loved your book, but I wonder how much time did you spend on the coast to research this book? You, um, you want to know how much time I spent on the coast for research? Well, um, I um, grew up, when I was growing up in South Georgia, my mother and I used to go canoe camping in the Okefenokee Swamp, just not with a guide, it was my mother, a canoe, and I. Um, so I have known marshlands and swamps all of my life. And when I started writing this novel, I, do, I did take, also our family took um, our vacations in North Carolina every year to the Smokies or over to the, to the coast of North Carolina. So I was familiar with that. And then I studied, um, when I received my degree in zoology, the University of Georgia, we studied the marshes. Um, but so I felt like I really knew them and I did take when I was writing the book I did take two trips over to make sure that I remembered everything correctly but basically my entire life has been researching habitats and marshes and swamps and savannas and so I was quite familiar with them there's yes. a question over here uh, I'll stay out of it thanks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How, how surprised were you to find that you were two and a half years on the bestseller list? Um, I was just hoping someone would read this crazy book um, called Where the Crawdads Sing. The first thing my agent said to me was, you know they're going to want another title. And um, that's what the publisher said first, is we have to find another title. But they looked and they, after a couple of weeks, they came back and said, there isn't another title for this book. So um, I, I've been so grateful for the people, my readers. I've, um, I've, I've never been so astounded in my life at the, as I have been for this um, reception of my book. And I'm thrilled and grateful and very happy. <laughs> Thanks. There's a question here. Uh, right up. Yeah. Um, how and at what age were you when you decided to buy that one-way ticket and <laughs> go to Africa? What brought you to that decision? 
And yeah, and then how, how old were you? I think I was 24 when, um, 23 or 24, when, when we decided to go to Africa. And um, it was a dream for me as I was studying zoology at the University of Georgia. I was just so, I just, that was all I wanted to do was go to Africa. And, and we talked to our professors about it. And they say, well, all wildlife students want to go to Africa. Forget about it. But then Jane Goodall came out with her book. And I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. So off we went. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question right, right there too. Hi, Delia. Um, yeah. Thank you for being here. And um, I know you're just back from the shoot um, for Crawdads. Can you tell us about that? Yes, they're making the movie for Where the Crawdads Sing. Um, Reese Witherspoon is producing, and Sony um, 3000 Pictures is um, making the movie. And it was so much fun being on the set. It was surreal, one of the most surreal um, events of my life. I mean, there I was, and honestly, I'd be sitting on the beach watching, and there would be Kaya sitting next to the fire with, with either Tate or, you know, for a few minutes with Tate and then a few minutes with Chase. And um, it was just the, the real moon would come up, and then the fake moon would come up to give more <laughs> light. And then there would be a big machine that made waves come just at the right moment. And then they'd start speaking and my words would come out. So that was, it, it, it just, they are doing, they're staying with the story. Um, of course, there's a few things that have to be changed. Everything doesn't translate from a book directly into a movie, but it was, it, they're doing a beautiful job, I think. It won't be out until next June. I don't know how I can wait, how long, you know, how I'm going to be able to wait that long, but I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Who else? Uh, anyone up there? We, uh, you can ask another question if nobody gets in line. <laughs> Um, when you first came out, you had said you getting here was a whole oh, story. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you for asking that. I wasn't hoping I'd have time for that. Okay. I have to tell this story. Okay. So um, when I came back from Africa, I, you know, we'd written the three nonfiction books. And um, as I said in the talk, I decided I wanted to write this novel. So I have these very good friends who happen to be here today. I, they can stand up if they want to. It's Bob, Ivy, and Jill Bowman. They're right here in the one, two, three, fourth row. So they had read our other books. They'd come to see us in Africa, in the Kalahari, and in the Luangwa. They've just been my dear friends all my life. So I told them that I was going to write this novel and what it was going to be about. And they were excited, thought it was a good idea. And then a few years went by and they asked how the novel was coming. I said, I'm still writing on the novel. They said, you should go to the Sun Valley Writers Conference because you'll learn all about, there'll be 600 or 800 people there and everybody's talking about writing novels or fiction, nonfiction. You'll learn a lot about writing. And I thought, 600, 800 people. I don't see that many people in a year. I don't see that many people in several years. I cannot go. And so a few years would go by and they'd say, are you still writing that novel? <laughs> and I'd say, yes, I'm still writing that novel. Well, you should go to the Sun Valley Writers Conference. <laughs> and so finally I said to them, I will go to that conference when I have published this novel and they invite me to present this novel. <laughs> And, and you know, you can actually, I'm sure you've done this, you can actually hear people thinking over the phone. And I could just, I knew they were thinking, not every author gets invited to the Sunwriters, you know, conference. But finally I got the call and I was able to call them and say, I am going to the Sun Valley Writers Conference to present my novel. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
We are here for inspiration. We've got time for one more question. How did you, uh, how did Kaya come to you? And did you live with her for 10 years? I've lived with Kaya all my life. There's a lot of me in Kaya. Um, living and studying nature all of my life, loving to be out in nature, um, being in isolated situations, being alone in the woods. That's where I feel the most comfortable. That's where I write the best. And um, I felt, of course, there's a lot of, all of us have a lot of Kaya in us. That's the point of the book. And I felt like she was the perfect one. This isolated young girl was the per per perfect person, character to expose our instincts and how we feel them when we're threatened, when we're alone. That's when we feel them the most. That's when we see our instincts. And I felt that was a, a, a good way to express that. Thank you, Delia. That's a wonderful place to end. Thank you Thank so you. much. Come on this way. So we'll, Delia will be signing books.